I'm Richard Finkel, a pediatric neurologist from Nemours Children's Hospital in Orlando, Florida. Welcome to this educational activity on exploring recent advances in the diagnosis and management of spinal muscular atrophy. The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Breaking Down the Barriers to Optimal Spinal Muscular Atrophy Care, Overcoming Diagnostic Delays, Facilitating Early Treatment, and Easing Caregiver Burden. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash FSB. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Our three main objectives for today are first to highlight some of the diagnostic hurdles associated with this disease and recent changes that may help overcome these barriers. Second, to examine approved and emerging therapies for treatment of SMA. And third, to discuss how such treatments might help ease the burden this disease imposes on the parents or caregivers of patients living with spinal muscular atrophy. So let's get started. Spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, is an autosomal recessive disorder characterized by degeneration of motor neurons in the spinal cord and brainstem, which results in progressive muscle atrophy and weakness. SMA affects approximately 1 in 6,000 to 11,000 live births in the United States and with a high carrier frequency in the range of 1 to 40 to 1 to 60. SMA is caused by homozygous deletions or loss of function mutations in the gene encoding for survival motor neuron 1 gene at the locus 5Q13 and this results in a deficiency of the SMN protein. And what we're going to be talking about today is limited to classic SMA, not some of the more rare forms, which are due to mutations in different genes. Now, in addition to the SMN1 gene, there is a parologous gene, SMN2, which also encodes the SMN protein, but preferentially excludes exon 7 during splicing, and as a result produces only a small fraction of functional SMN protein as compared to SMN1. SMA is classified into several phenotypes based upon the age of onset of the disease and the maximal degree of motor function achieved by the affected individual. The number of copies of the SMN2 gene modifies the disease phenotype such that patients with a higher number of the SMN2 copy and a higher level of SMN protein generally have a less severe phenotype. Approximately half of patients diagnosed with SMA have type 1, which is the most severe form, with an early onset typically within the first six months of age, and they fail to gain independent sitting. Now, these babies are born normally, and they develop these symptoms within the first few months of life. And unfortunately, uh, without supportive intervention, uh, they are not likely to survive beyond the first two years of life. In type 2 SMA, which is a bit less severe, the onset of symptoms occurs later, between 6 and 18 months of age. Although type 2 children are generally able to sit without support, and some may even stand, they are never able to walk independently. Type 3 SMA uh, have even a less severe uh, phenotype. And these are children who uh, do gain the ability to walk and reach major milestones, but unfortunately uh, may often lose the ability to walk over time as the disease progresses. Type 4 SMA is the most uncommon form, only about 1% of patients overall. And this includes adults uh, who have later onset of symptoms after age 18 years. And they typically have a slowly progressive impairment with their gait and gross motor function. If a child has clinical features of SMA, the diagnosis can be confirmed through genetic testing. If there is a homozygous deletion of both copies of exon 7 on the SMN1 gene, the diagnosis is made and you do not need to go any further. That means you do not need to do EMG, MRI scan, or other diagnostic procedures to confirm the diagnosis. And I would point out that this test is only for children with the classic form of SMA, not some of the other rare forms that are due to different types of gene mutations. Now, there is a small proportion of patients, approximately 5%, who lack complete function of the SMN1 
protein due to a compound heterozygous state where they have a deletion of the SMN1 gene on one allele and a mutation on the second allele. In this situation, it is necessary to do gene copy number testing. If the patient possesses only a single copy of SMN1, then it is possible that the remaining allele uh, contains subtle mutations, including point mutations, insertions, and deletions that render uh, a homozygous dysfunction of the gene. Sequencing of the coding region of the remaining SMN1 copy may identify the mutation on the remaining allele and confirm the diagnosis of SMA. So there are really two types of diagnostic tests. In about 95%, looking for the homozygous deletion is sufficient, but in that other 5%, it is important to remember that you need to check the copy number and do a sequencing test. Due to the progressive nature of SMA, the timing of its diagnosis is crucial. Early diagnosis may lead to early supportive care in reduction in patient and caregiver stress. Although awareness of SMA is increasing, diagnostic delay is common as SMA symptoms can vary widely in onset and severity and can resemble other neuromuscular diseases. In fact, a recent systematic review of the literature found the weighted diagnostic delay between symptom onset and diagnosis was 3.6 months for babies with SMA type 1, 14.3 months for infants and young children with type 2, and 43.6 months for children with type 3 SMA. Fortunately, SMA was added to the recommended uniform screening panel for newborns in the United States in July 2018. Now, each state needs to decide whether to include SMA in its required screening, although many of these states will rely upon the federal RUSP guidelines. Hopefully, this will end the diagnostic delay in SMA such that a lot of these patients will now be identified pre-symptomatically as newborns. And now that we have an approved therapy that targets the underlying pathology of the disease, we will be able to initiate treatment uh, earlier, hopefully even pre-symptomatically. Uh, we're also eager uh, to see some of the new evolving treatments that are in different stages of clinical development as they become available. When we come back, I'll be joined by Dr. Diana Castro, who will lend her expertise to a discussion of spinal muscular atrophy and the recent advances in its treatment. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining me today is my colleague, Dr. Diana Castro. Dr. Castro is a neurologist at Children's Health who specializes in pediatric neurology and neuromuscular medicine. She is also an assistant professor of pediatrics and neurology and neurotherapeutics at the UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Please welcome Dr. Diana Castro. So, Diana, thanks for joining me today. Uh, we have a lot to cover. I thought maybe the first thing would be to go through some of the uh, antisense oligonucleotide treatment with nusinersen, the sure. first approved drug for SMA. Sure. Yes, like you say, so nusinersen is the first drug FDA approved for the treatment of spinal muscular atrophy, not only type 1, type 2, and type 3 as well. It's an injection. It's an intrathecal injection that we give over one to three minutes. Usually we will get CSF outside, then we'll inject the five mLs or 12 milligrams of the medication. So this is an antisense oligonucleotide. We know that the problem with this condition is the lack of having the SMN1 gene. So this medication will work with the backup gene or SMN2. And what it does is what it makes the exon 7 being included in most of the sequencing what it will give, give us a higher level of the protein or functional protein for that anterior horn cell to work. Right, I see on this figure here that it modulates the splicing, so mm -hmm. it, it allows for more inclusion of exon 7 in the transcript, and in that way the SMN2 gene produces more of this SMN protein that's so critical for these neuromuscular patients, these, the cells to function. Exactly. So, um, there have now been several thousand patients treated with nursing. Uh, can you share with us you know, your experience? 
I mean, the experience has been actually great. We're treating all uh, kind of patients, type 1, 2, and 3. I see patients until 21 years of age, so I don't have experience with adults, with older mm -hmm. patients. Uh, but it has been really good in terms of side effect profile. It, I think we'll talk a little bit more later on about that, but well tolerated. The procedure is well tolerated. It's a lumbar puncture, so you get some of the side effects like headaches and so on. But other than that, it has been great. And in terms of efficacy, I think when we talk about the studies, um, my experience has been very similar to that. Great. To the results. Well, let's turn to some of the data that supports the approval of this drug, and then we can maybe comment on our own experience. Sure. So there were two big types of studies, right? The randomized studies and the open label studies. And I will talk, or we will talk about the randomized, we can talk about Endear and Cherish, and some of the open label like Shine and Nurture. So Endear, it's I think the most important study out of all the studies that were performed. It's a phase three study of Nusinersen versus Shem. So it was for young patients uh, less than six months of age. They were screened and all of them had two copies of SMN2. So they were gonna develop most likely a spinal muscular atrophy type one, right? So there were 121 patients, 80 of them were uh, um, randomized to nusinersen and 41 randomized to sham injection. And there were some primary and secondary endpoints. Right, I think, uh, as you say, this was a pivotal study. Mm -hmm. And there were certainly some challenges because there were some ethical concerns I think we all had of, about conducting a randomized controlled study in these babies who we know genetically were going to progress. Yeah. I think uh, we can look back now and understand that the babies that were randomized to the sham control, in fact, were given the opportunity to get the drug um, once the study had reached a certain point, and we'll go into that in a minute. Yes, yes. So in the end, I think it worked out well for everyone. Exactly. Yeah, so I think we can uh, first talk about the primary endpoints. So the primary endpoints, uh, the first one was motor milestones, and they were measured by Heine, or the Hammersmith Infant Neurologic Scale. And what it talks is about the normal development in these kids. So what you will see in a normal kid, holding their head, sitting, walking, standing and walking independently. But unfortunately, what we see in this population with spinal muscular atrophy is kids that are, are not gonna be able to hold their head, they are not gonna be able to sit, stand up or walk. And what we found is actually the patients that were uh, randomized to sham control, they follow the natural history of these patients, meaning not able to reach any normal milestones. But the patients that were treated, in the interim analysis, 41% of them reach some kind of you know, milestone or appropriate milestone for their age, and at final analysis, 51% of them. And I don't know if you want to talk about mm -hmm. the specifics. Well, how, how many of the sham control group showed some improvement? Zero percent. So that's a pretty striking difference. It is Forty-one percent yes. versus zero. Yeah. I can see why that's pretty persuasive. And you know, and sometimes when you say fifty-one percent, forty-one percent, people don't understand exactly what we're talking about. But we're talking about kids that, again, we're not going to be able to hold their set, hold their head, sit, stand up. Now we're seeing kids with spinal muscular atrophy type one that are able to stand up and walk independently. So it's a, it's definitely a striking result. Right, and I think we were both at a recent meeting where we saw some updated information on these children that they're continuing to make progress. Yes. So this 51% is not really the end, it's, it's just one snapshot in time. Exactly, that's a very good point, yeah. Well, t tell me a little bit more about uh, the endpoints from the Endear study. So the primary endpoint, like I say, Heine, the other primary endpoint was the event-free survival. So that's defined as death or the permanent ventilation. And permanent ventilation for us in the studies is defined as being on uh, ventilation for more than 16 hours a day for more than 21 days in a row without a clear trigger or you know, like infection or things like that. So the percentage of patients that got to the uh, event free survival, the ones that were treated was 61% of them compared to 32% in the sham control. And then in terms of death, there was no death in 84% of them compared to 61% in the sham. That is in terms of the primary endpoint. In terms of the secondary endpoint, the CHOP intent is the, the scale that we use for motor function. And uh, it was defined as if the patient was able to get at least four points or gain four points in this scale, this was considered a responder. Mm -hmm. 
And so there were two motor scales. Yes. You mentioned first the high knee. Mm -hmm. That was the primary one. And this chop and tent was a supportive second scale. Exactly, I exactly. See. And it's more detailed, right? Because it's a scale that will tell you about upper extremity, lower extremity function, and so mm -hmm. on. So 71% of the patients who got the medication were considered as responders, meaning they had more than four points improvement in this scale compared with only 3% of the patients were, mm -hmm. that were in the sham control or not getting the medication. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Castro, what did we learn about the adverse events and the safety profile? of nusinersen in the Endear study? So for the small children, it actually the most common side effect that we saw and that and you were asking me about my practice and that I still see in my practice is infections. It's upper and lower respiratory infection as well as fever. Usually fever will be related mm -hmm. to the infection anyway. I see, but not related to the drug but not, or mm -hmm. the procedure, the lumbar no. puncture. No, 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 not so, in that age. So it, it appeared from the publication that the adverse events were similar in the two groups, the treated group and the sham control group, with regards to anything that would be drug related. Exactly. It appears that this is a pretty safe drug. Exactly. But it is a little complicated to administer it. Yes, I mean, yeah, it's a, the fact that it's a lumbar puncture makes things a little bit challenging, but. Right. Yeah. Well, let's turn now to the treatment of children with type 2 SMA through the CHERISH study. Can exactly. Can you walk us through that? So the CHERISH study is a phase three study that was for older patients, so between two to 12 years of age. These patients were gonna develop most likely type two SMA. And there were 126 patients, 84 were randomized to nursing, nursing and 42 to the sham injection. Like we talked about in the previous study, there were some primary endpoints and secondary endpoints. The primary endpoint is with another scale called Hammersmith Functional Motor Scale Expanded, and it was looked through a period of time of 15 months. So let, let's look at the data from the CHERIS study. Can mm -hmm. you walk us through that? Sure. So here we see this scale that shows you the patients that were treated in the blue line compared with the patients that were not getting the medication. And if you see studies looking at the natural history of this condition, it's very similar to what we're seeing here in the sham control, right? So the patients that are not getting medication will continuously, progressively, will continue losing their motor abilities, right? This scale will evaluate the ability to see, the ability to roll, the ability to stand up and doing all these things. And what you see is that the patients that are not treated have a progressive deterioration compared with patients that are getting medication who start getting points over time against the natural history of these patients. And you have two scales here. One is the Hammersmith and the other one is for the upper limb module. So it's another type of scale that helps us looking at the upper extremity. Right. So what I find interesting when we look at the Hammersmith data on the left-hand figure is that there is a little bit of improvement the first six months in the sham controlled group, but it's probably placebo effect, yeah. uh, but it's less than two points. And I think we generally consider plus or minus two points in that scale to be the day-to-day -day mm -hmm, variation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And anything above two points to be clinically meaningful. It took about six months until you saw a spread between the sham control group and the treated arm. And yes. I think that's something that I try to keep in mind with my patients and mm. to the parents, to tell them that when, when we start these treatments, not to expect any immediate changes. Yes. That it's gonna take a little while for this to work and to be visible. Kind of help you setting up realistic goals exactly. with the families, with the patients, yeah. that's true. Now it's interesting if you look at the right hand figure with the room that actually you see even maybe earlier improvement in the upper limb function. Because mm -hmm. again, these are children who are not weight bearing generally or not walking. So from a functional point of view, considering their activities of daily living, obviously that's a very important response as well. Exactly, I think more than anything is that to remember that, that again, these patients will lose this kind of, this basic abilities, you know, to be able to brush their teeth, to fix their hair, things that are so necessary in a day to day. So I understand there were some additional outcomes in the CHERISH study. Do you wanna uh, guide us through that? Yeah, I think that just to kind of summarize that first was that in the final analysis of the study, 57% of the children in the NUSI nursing group compared with 26% in the uh, sham control had an increase from baseline to month 15, right? What we just show in the, in the graphic, but it was significant increase. 
And the other thing is that the incidence of adverse events was similar in both the nursing nursing group and the control group. So again, we're not seeing a lot of difference in terms of adverse events related mm -hmm. to the medication. Most of the things we're seeing that I guess mm -hmm. in your practice is the same. It's uh, in the older kids I see more related to the lumbar puncture, not yes. the medication itself. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think another way to look at the data that I found interesting was that if you, instead of just looking at the relative percentages of how many improved on the Hammersmith scale, you know, if you look at the overall data, it's, it seemed like there was a pretty clear divergence where the treated group went up an average of four points over the 15 months, and the untreated or sham control group went down two points. So again, we're seeing a divergence, uh, clearly from the natural history, as you said, yes. similar to the same pattern we saw in the babies uh, in the CHERISH study. Exactly. So what about some of the longer term assessment regarding the safety and efficacy of nucinersin for it, children with SMA? Yeah, so what we just discussed, two of the randomized studies, but then we're moving now more towards the open label, right? So mm -hmm. all of those studies that were performed in kids less than six months, kids between two to 12 years of age, all of those patients were transitioned to this study called SHINE. So this is a continuous study for uh, open label use of nosinersin. So Dr. Castro, give us some of the data that's emerging from the SHINE study, particularly focusing on the babies who are in the ENDEAR study who are, have now migrated into this open label extension. There were uh, 81 patients that were treated with nosinersin and there were 41 patients that were untreated in ENDEAR. Then they moved to this new study called SHINE, and all of them obviously are getting medication. 65 patients moved that were getting medication before, and they continue getting medication now in SHINE, and 24 patients that were not getting medication now start getting medication in this new study. So what happened to those other patients that didn't S come into SHINE? So some of those patients die. So that's why we have less patients now included, and then you see that uh, because these patients were not getting treatment, right? Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, uh, many of them didn't get to the next part of the study. And right, I guess that gets to the point of how important it is to give good standard of care yes. while they're getting this treatment, yes. because it doesn't have an immediate effect. It's not a cure, uh, but we need to sustain them and try to wait until the drug can kick in and provide some benefit. Yeah, you're making the point out of the 81 patients that were getting medication before, even though there were 81, there were 65 only that moved to the next study, mm -hmm. even though they were getting medication, that's a great point to make because it's not all about the medication, it's, it's about standards mm -hmm. of care. And, but what is very important about this set of information is that uh, the patients that transition from not getting medication to start getting medication later on, these patients were older, were already around 15, 17 months of age without any medication. Mm -hmm. And once they start med getting medication, some of them, they start getting, you start seeing some improvement in the high knee. What we'll see is that these patients, one day they start getting the medication, it starts slowly getting some of those milestones. So you can see here, there was a difference at least of 1.1 point on those patients compared to the ones that were getting medication before and now, mm -hmm. currently, they continue getting improvements in their motor scales, so 5.8. So that would suggest to me that those who were treated earlier had a more robust response, but those who were treated later still had the capacity to show some response. Exactly, but and then the other point to make is the event-free survival in uh, weeks, in the studies reported as weeks. So the patients that got uh, sham initially and they moved to nucinersin, uh, they had 22.6 weeks to start to the first event, meaning death or permanent ventilation. Compared to the patients that got medication before and continue getting medication, these patients went all the way to 73 weeks to get to the first event uh, free survival point. Right. So I understand that the SHINE study is continuing to, to move on mm -hmm. and that we'll continue to learn as these patients get older and as they grow and see how they do from their motor function and also from their respiratory and survival. But uh, tell me also about this pre-symptomatic study that you told us about earlier. Uh, 
What's about this nurture study? Yes, so the nurture study um, was uh, another open label study in pre-symptomatic babies. So these babies, most of them were because they had a sibling who had the diagnosis of spinal muscular atrophy. So these babies, these mothers got amniocentesis and got uh, tested early. Uh, most of these babies were treated before 40 days of life and they were, like it says, pre-symptomatic. So there were not signs of respiratory difficulties, there were not signs of anything else. Uh, some of them had uh, two copies of SMN2, some of them had three copies of SMN2. And the last uh, cutoff that we have is actually from this year, May 2018, and they just present that information in World uh, Muscle Society Congress. And uh, it shows that 25 out of 25 patients are still alive. That seems like a big difference from the Endear study. Exactly. That's already telling you a lot. So survival was very different. It's, it's absolutely What about different. with motor function? What have we learned so far? But let me tell you before that, the time of, of right now, the, the age of these patients, it's almost we're getting close to three years of age. So we have patients between two to three years of age that are alive. And in terms of motor function, um, the same scale that we have been talking about, the Heine, has been used in this group. And what we know is that 100% of the patients are able to hold their head, 100% of the patients are able to sit independently. Then you have two-thirds of the patients that are already standing and walking with assistance. And you have another little bit less than two-thirds that is also able to walk independently. So you're really describing something that's transformative. Because you're taking babies who genetically are, you could predict that they're going to be type 1 or type 2 based on their copy number. Yes. And you're saying that they're all sitting, so they're all at least type 2, and many of them are standing and walking, oh, okay. so type 3. Yes. And it sounds like they're making these milestones even at a normal age. Exactly. That, so typically developing children. Exactly. It's, it's amazing. It's really, really changing our practice. I'm sure you have had this. Our landscape is changing a lot, but it's a, it's a good change. We're seeing amazing yeah. results. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, let's turn now to some of the emerging treatments that are still under clinical development. <clears throat> so the gene therapy is a very hot topic mm -hmm. uh, for SMA. Um, Tell us a little bit about this. The study was 15 patients genetically confirmed with spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, all of them had uh, two copies of SMN2, and they had a confirmed diagnosis, obviously, uh, the genetic confirmation of having a deletion or a defect in SMN1. Um, there were two groups, two cohorts. Uh, three patients were treated with a uh, low dose, and uh, 12 patients were treated with a high dose. Um, now, this was mm -hmm. given... Intravenously. intravenously. So how does it get to the motor neuron? Uh, it's, it can cross the uh, CSF barrier. Oh, so it can cross so, the blood-brain barrier. Yes. So that's, that's a nice advantage that's of this. That's a very nice yeah. advantage, yes, yeah. to be able to give it IV. It's, uh, it's intravenously and it's only one time. It was given only one. Single treatment. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And the outcomes of this study were mainly looking at safety and looking at the uh, motor outcomes, yeah. Right, so I understand the, the data is really quite special. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your interpretation? Yeah, so out of these patients, the 15 patients, all of these patients are alive. And that's, they're all alive. Exactly. They're mm. still alive. They, they are, uh, most of these patients finished treatment or the time of follow-up was around last year, end of last year. And by that point, uh, all of them are alive compared to, if you look at the natural history of studies for SMA type 1, only 8% of these patients will be alive at this age, right? So that's a right? pretty spectacular so it's, difference, it's, yeah. it's pretty good. Um, the difference also in terms of the motor function, so they use the chopping 10, again, mm -hmm. like we talked about this mm -hmm. scale before, and the difference from baseline is dramatic. So they, these patients start getting points in this scale rapidly over a month after three months after they received the first dose. And again, this is one time, so they don't require follow-ups. Um, what we're seeing is that they, at least right now that we know, uh, the 12 patients that received the high dose, 11 of them sat independently. So Nine, type two, yes, in effect. Yeah. Exactly. Nine roll over. 
11 can feed by mouth and could speak, and two of them are walking independently. Another transformative Another, treatment. Yes. So where, where do we stand with this drug development, with the Vexus uh, 101? So the, the, that was a phase one. Now we, uh, and this was a one center only. Mm -hmm. Now there's, it's a multi-center study and it's more as a phase three. The, there are three different types of studies. One of them, it's called STRIVE. It's for less than six months of age, babies. And it's given IV as well, times single one. Single dose. Single Just dose. like the first study. Just exactly I replicating see. the same study. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the other types of treatment for SMA uh, that are in the pipeline yes. through clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are other types that may resemble the same mechanism, like for example, nusinersen, it's, um, it's given intrathecally, right? Mm -hmm. There is another medication that was developed, uh, it's called Ristiplem. And it's a medication that it's also going to make the levels of uh, SMN2 uh, protein, the levels that come from the SMN2 gene, higher, uh, but it's oral. It's a different yes. medication. It's just so it's also a splicing modifier. It works on this backup SMN2 gene to try to promote the inclusion of exon 7, mm -hmm. this is similar to what mm -hmm. Newson Nursen does, mm -hmm. make more of that protein. Mm -hmm. But it seems like it has a potential advantage because it's oral and it could get into systemic tissues, not just tissues. to motor neurons. Exactly, exactly. So that uh, study is ongoing and, and we have several sites here in the US. And then there is another study, um, LMI1070, but I believe this is a study in Europe. That's the Branaplam, I believe, that yeah. is only in Europe at in the Europe. moment for the type yes. 1. Yes. But that's also an oral splicing modifier. So the same mechanism. I see. Yeah. But then we have other type of studies, for example, that are more uh, neuroprotective. So there was a study with a medication called Olexosyme, mm -hmm. and I understand they are not um, Ongoing yeah, that's, it's unfortunate because it looked like that was a big two-year study, uh, randomized controlled study um, in uh, children and young adults, uh, and it showed like a, a stabilizing effect, uh, but unfortunately the drug company elected not to push forward with that. I suppose now that we have these drugs that focus on increasing SMN protein that are yeah, showing well. such responses, um, but it's still yeah. unfortunate because, you know, I think Ultimately, treatment for SMA involve uh, some combination of treatment, so it would be nice to have different strategies. So hopefully that's on the shelf, but maybe they'll take it back off sometime. Yeah, that's what I see. We're going to, as I said, the landscape has been changing a lot for us, but we're going to end up using likely a uh, combination of therapy. Right. So there are other therapies that will help that will, um, for example, periodostic mean, mm. mestinone, it's a medication yes. we use for myasthenia gravis that acts at the neuromuscular junction. Mm. Now there is a study, ongoing study, a phase two study, looking at that medication for patients with SMA. Why? Because we know that these patients actually have neuromuscular junction problems. So it may be helpful for some of these patients. Right. Um, there is another compound that I don't know if you if you want to talk about the um, cytokinetics? Sure, let's, um, let's talk about that for a minute because that that's a treatment trial that uh, is supposed to make the muscle contract a little harder with a little Stronger. more force. Mm -hmm. Where does that stand? Uh, there was a phase two uh, study. It's an oral compound uh, for uh, SMA type two mm -hmm. and they included patients that were older than 12 years of age. Uh, the results, um, I don't think they were that, um, you know, Right, they haven't impactful. been publicly released as yet yes. in any sort of published form, but mm -hmm. it sounds like that may offer some benefit, but we're waiting to hear more yes. from the company yes. about the path forward. Yeah. <coughs> so that may be another option for a combinatorial mm -hmm. kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's a small study with the uh, foraminopyridine, uh, which... Uh, has been used to, in adults to see if it helps with fatigue, mm -hmm. and we'll wait and see if, if that shows any benefit in this population. And last one, I remember myostatin inhibitor that has been used for Duchenne yes. muscular dystrophy. Now it's going to be used for patients with spinal muscular atrophy as well. Yeah. So many options. So now we're targeting muscle because we know that 
muscle tissue is also deficient in the SMN protein. We mm -hmm. just don't know how important that is. The primary defect is in the motor neuron, but we think muscle strategies may also be important. And so again, like neuromuscular junction as well. I think yes. definitely looking at the, at the right targets, that definitely. Diana, thank you. That was a great discussion. It is clearly a very exciting time to be involved in SMA research and clinical care, and it must be very rewarding to you to see these babies in the clinic and to treat them and to see this progress. So when we come back, Dr. Castro and I uh, will look at the impact of SMA on the people who are treating these patients, their parents and their caregivers. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Welcome back. SMA not only imposes a substantial burden on patients living with SMA, but also on the people who care for them, their parents and caregivers. With that in mind, Diana, uh, let's look towards uh, the different aspects of a survey that was conducted, uh, which I think provided us with some very meaningful and useful information as we consider uh, treating these patients in the new world here of SMA emerging therapeutics. What does it mean for the patient and in particular for their parents and the caregivers? Yeah, so Richard, we had a survey of 20 parents or caregivers of patients with spinal muscular atrophy. 19 of them had at least one child with spinal muscular atrophy, and the only one had uh, two children with SMA. If you look at the types of SMA in this survey population, it was around one third of them type one, one third type two, and one more third uh, type three. And uh, they asked some of the questions related to how long did it take to get the diagnosis done. Pretty important. And, yeah. Yes, and what we see is that most patients, uh, for most patients it was around three to six months. Around 45% of them took three to six months to get to the diagnosis, but there were some of them that even up to two years to get to the diagnosis. When you look at the family who had two kids, the kid that the second kid got diagnosed right away, well, most likely, because expect. yes, now these days obviously we have genetic testing that it's easily available and you can get it diagnosed also in triuterum. Right, so if the parents know what to look for if they have a child with SMA. I think we as neurologists also have to be very careful to try to pick up that first early sign. Yes. If we're sent a child with developmental delay, a little hypotonia, you know, we have to really think about SMA because we now understand that earlier identification, early diagnosis offers an opportunity for earlier treatment. Yeah, and not only as neurologists, but the pediatricians, right? Yes. Pediatricians and that's get them very early. Probably the biggest early. challenge, yes. exactly. Yes, that's the biggest challenge. Good. So I think what I found interesting from this survey also was uh, trying to get an idea about the level of function that these children have, not just from the point of view of the clinical trials where we use these motor scales, mm -hmm. but what about activities of daily living? So in addition to being able to sit or to walk, uh, can they feed themselves? Can they dress themselves? Uh, can they use a smartphone, which is increasingly important these days? Mm -hmm. So I found that uh, the information here and understanding that this was a group of parents that included type one children, type two, and type, and type three, three. But I think now that we need to acquire what I'll call real world data, because there are thousands of children now being treated with SMA who were not part of the clinical trials, we need to really start to capture what does this drug do for these children in a real world context with mm -hmm. their activities of daily living. And I think this survey highlights some of the importance here. Just example, being able to use the toilet independently. That's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully we'll be able to capture more of these types of activities as we gain more experience with treatment of these children. And just an extra point to that is that to say that the studies included certain type of population with spinal muscular atrophy, right? We're now yes. treating patients that are completely different from, from the studies. So we definitely have to learn very different information probably. Right. And I think there's some challenges here because uh, we don't really know what the expectations are from, let's say, an older type 1 patient, a five-year-old type 1. We are learning that they have the capacity to improve, but what can we really tell the parents about their expectations? Mm -hmm. I think it's a little early for mm -hmm. that. Um, similarly, uh, we're now treating type 3 patients who we're not really focused on in the clinical trials. So these are patients, you know, older children, teenagers, even adults, who are walking but slowly losing, losing. their ambulation skills. 
Uh, what can we expect from treatment there? So it's, mm -hmm. it's a very exciting time to be involved in treating SMA patients, but there's still clearly a lot to learn. To learn. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, turn now to uh, the parents' expectations uh, as to what would be the most significant impact of a treatment and of having SMA yeah. on their child. I think the survey kind of tells me what I see in clinic very commonly. I mean, not only besides the motor function that we know they have their deficits in terms of the motor strand and function, it's the respiratory symptoms. I think that's the most important for the families. And I think we were talking about that before. It's like the families are always concerned. You know, they get a illness, they get a respiratory illness, and it sets them back a lot. Right, and that's not as predictable. The, the motor yeah. function is fairly consistent Stable. day to day. Mm -hmm. They've learned how to adapt to that and deal with it. And of course, they're hoping that these treatments will improve that. But it seems like from this data that's shown on the slide, that it's the unpredictable nature of the respiratory symptoms that they're very concerned exactly. about. And understandably so, because mm -hmm. as you said, just a simple viral illness can lend, you know, they can end up in the hospital for two weeks. Yes. Right. So I think towards that, some of the early data coming out from both the Newson Nursen and the Avexis 101 is suggesting that there is a global benefit of these drugs. Mm -hmm. They are staying out of the hospital. It's helping them in their respiratory and in their feeding activities, but there's still a lot more to be learned here. Yes. So let's talk now about how parents are looking at the type of supportive care, because I think we realize that in the symptomatic patient with SMA, none of these treatments are a cure, and it's still critically important that we focus on good standard of care. Uh, and as you can see uh, from the data shown here, 75% uh, of the parents feel that focusing on respiratory care is a priority and they're involved in that. Nutritional support, feeding therapy, speech therapy, and over half. Uh, physical and occupational therapy in almost all patients. Um, and importantly, uh, mobility equipment uh, to help promote them to be independent in their function. So I think what I take home from this very important data is that uh, it's, it's not sufficient just to treat with these drugs. You have to see them in a multidisciplinary clinic. You need to focus on their respiratory care and have a pulmonary specialist who can s support them. You need to focus on their nutrition and have a dietitian, an orthopedic surgeon, physical therapist. And I understand that's what you do in your clinic is you was, try to coordinate that care. I was, gonna, I was thinking about that. I mean, both of us, I think we're privileged with what we yes. have in our clinics, right? We have our physical therapist, occupational therapist, nutritionist, genetic counselor, everybody right there available to see our patients. Unfortunately, that's not the situation for many patients, uh, for many physicians outside. And I think um, just keeping in mind what is the standard? Even though, even if you don't have the whole multidisciplinary clinic and you cannot have access to that neurologist, it's, I think, is their, um, they have to coordinate that care. Well, let's now turn to some of the topics on caregiver burden, because I found this quite interesting. Uh, so this particular topic uh, was asking the parents uh, with regards to the care that they're providing their child with SMA, and how do they feel about that? Do they have enough time for themselves uh, because they're spending so much time caring for their child with mm -hmm. SMA? And as you can see here, uh, about 60% are saying that either often or always they're feeling that there just isn't enough time for themselves. So in two thirds of the cases represented here, I think that's a real issue. So I, what I've learned from this is that it is important for us to speak to the parents and make sure that they're not feeling that they're overburdened. And we need more social workers yes. and uh, we need more grandmothers. <laughs> and we need, we need support. A, yes, a lot of help. Because yes. I think it's, it, it often falls to one parent, usually the mother, um, and it's easy to get overwhelmed with all the care that's oh, required yes. here. You can get overwhelmed with your own children yes. <laughs> without SMA. Well, even so when they're typically developing children, it, it could yes, be a it's challenge. it's very challenging for these Indeed. moms and, and parents. I think also it, it, this next question I found particularly interesting. By devoting so much time to your child with SMA, um, ha have you suffered in your own health? Uh, physically, emotionally. And again, you can see that about 70% are saying sometimes, often, or even always, they're, they're just feeling that they're not in good health. Yeah. So we need to explore this more. I think we need to get a sense, is it 
just that they're totally fatigued because they're getting up at night and they're having to mm -hmm. care with their child, they're sleep deprived, they don't have enough help. Is it uh, a mental uh, type of issue of the constant stress, uh, just worrying about their child? And there's some other questions here that get into this in a little more detail. Like you said, not only physical, mentally, but for example, I see very often the moms who have to carry older patients, right? They start suffering from back pain and all of these problems that come, you know, as part of taking care of these children. Right. And, and uh, an additional question I found to be quite interesting is the impact of caring for their child with SMA on their relationship with other family members, uh, with their partner, uh, with other children they may have. Friends. Um, and, and understandably, uh, a child with SMA is going to take a lot of time, but I, unfortunately, it sometimes takes time away from your partner, your other child. And as you can see here, again, uh, that you had about 60%, maybe two-thirds of the cases, that this was a recurring issue. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think it falls back to us as caregivers to say, we need to recognize this. We need to ask the parents and make sure that the whole family is uh, able to thrive here. Because we're so excited with these new treatments, but let's not exactly. forget the burden on the family. Yeah. And they feel isolated. I think that has been the, the common complaint or the common, what I hear from the moms especially is they're isolated. They are at home whole day with many of these kids that are very, um, for example, mechanically dependent, then trade, so on. They, it requires a lot and it takes the whole day to stay at home so they don't have much relation with the outside. So it's, it's yeah. very sad well, that, That's very true. Mm -hmm. I think also the, uh, the point of just how stressed out are they to get back to that theme uh, and how does that affect them in their daily activities and the data from this question again you know if you look at this something like 75 percent of parents are saying this is a recurring problem uh, and in a quarter it's like a constant almost daily activity mm -hmm. that I'm just stressed out about caring for my child and trying to do everything else, everything else. Uh, for myself, for my partner, for my other children, for work. So many of these parents stop working to be at home yeah. for their child mm -hmm. and that has an economic burden on the family, of course. So I think this was a particularly important question and the data instructive for me. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And uh, this next question I also found interesting because you always wonder as a physician, you know, how realistic are the expectations of the parents when they get these new treatments? Because they read about it, they see on Facebook, they, you know, it, there's a lot of buzz about these new treatments, but do the parents really have some sort of reasonable expectation or not? You know, is their baby with type 1 SMA going to someday get up and walk? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we would hope so, but hope. the data yet, it's, we're not there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. just too early to say. So I thought this was you know, quite interesting to say, you know, with respect to taking care of their child, uh, you know, how do they feel and are they afraid of what the future holds? And it sounds like even with these treatments uh, and the great promise that they hold, there's, the parents are almost overwhelmingly uh, concerned about the future. Yes. Are these children going to grow up and be able to be self-sufficient? Are they going to be independent? Are they always going to need to be dependent on their parents or other caregivers? Yes. So you can see that come through in the data here. And then finally, I, th I thought this was pretty important information. It didn't come as a surprise to me uh, to see that 75% uh, of parents uh, admit to having some issues with anxiety, 45% with depression. To your point, social, isolation. social isolation and 70 percent, over two-thirds, feel mm -hmm. like they're just confined to caregiver. A third, job loss, as we talked about, uh, and the stress on their relationship, on a marriage or living arrangement. Um, so these are all huge points, and I think it's, it will be in incredibly important for us as neurologists caring for these children and for other caregivers um, to sort of keep this in mind. Because uh, the child's only going to do as well as the parent does. Exactly. 
Yeah, it, it's, it's again, it's absolutely stressful. Yeah. I mean, any of us yeah. will have a normal child who has a bad night. Next day you go to work and you're not feeling well the yeah. whole day. These families are continuously waking up every night to make them, to move them from one place to the other one, check on their oxygen. All of those things is, it's, is really hard for these families. Right. So let's focus now on uh, the parent's expectations, specifically on their child who has been treated with nusinersen. Mm -hmm. So of these 20 parents, uh, we have children that have been treated. What has been their experience? And as you can see here, 75% are saying it's definitely had a positive impact, but my children still have an incredible burden of disease. It's not like they're suddenly eating fine, they're breathing fine, uh, they're getting up and walking. Uh, so yes, they're making improvement, and we are seeing that some of these children are now able to start eating again, that they're needing less BiPAP support, and hopefully in the future they'll continue to improve there. Mm -hmm. But I think from this data, it would suggest that there still is a substantial burden of disease on these children, and we need to keep that in mind, and also share that with other parents who are considering these different treatments for their children. Yeah, and we were talking about different treatments before, you know, other uh, things, other targets in terms of the condition. Mm -hmm. For example, fatigue, I think that's one of the, the most important ones that I see in, in the family or the children, or one of the biggest complaints. You know, they go to school, but after they come from school, they are completely done for the day. So uh, hopefully that will that, help us later that's on. That's right. And we, I don't think we always ask the right questions in yes. the clinic. We say, well, can your child feed himself? And they can say yes. But what I didn't ask in the past was, can your child feed himself the whole meal? Oh, no, no. only <laughs> once, and then they get tired, and I have to yes. feed them the rest. Yes. So now with the Nusin Nursin, and hopefully also with the uh, gene therapy and other treatments, you know, you're going to see that um, not only are they gaining skills, new skills, such as sitting, walking, but they're gaining an endurance. endurance. They're able to complete a mm -hmm. task mm -hmm. and to be more independent, such yes. as with their feeding or yes. self-care skills. So That's a good fine. point. Mm -hmm. So. I, the next question uh, that was asked in the survey is, uh, with this approval of nusinersen, now it's available by prescription, and with these other therapies that are on the horizon for treatment of SMA, how hopeful were these parents that the burden of disease would be lessened? Mm -hmm. In other words, that these children actually would be able to have a better quality of life. Uh, and, and I think the responses are, are quite favorable, they're mm -hmm. positive. So about half are saying they're somewhat hopeful. They're not so sure. They're being careful here. 40% uh, are maybe a little more hopeful, and 10% are very hopeful. So I think, in general, the parents are showing that they have reasonable expectations. And again, I think it comes back to the point of standard of care, right? We want these parents to be hopeful, but at the same time, we want them to be realistic and to come back to us, to come back and follow up with the specialists they need to they need to see to make sure that they have adequate equipment, respiratory equipment, for example, you know. So if we keep that hope to a realistic hope, you know, that also help us as physicians to be able to bring mm -hmm. these patients to us and make sure that we are doing everything they need. Good. Diana, thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion on the early diagnosis and treatment of children living with SMA. I want to make a few concluding remarks. First, genetic testing can readily facilitate the diagnosis of SMA. Importantly, newborn screening is now a recommended part of the RUSP, opening the door for the vast majority of patients who are born with SMA to be identified even pre-symptomatically and to be treated early in their disease course. Third point is that the treatment for children with SMA uh, continues to evolve, and I hope I've been able to emphasize the importance of the standard of care guidelines and a coordinated care approach. The next point is that nusinersen is an FDA-approved treatment that can change the course of SMA, and that there are other therapeutic treatments that are currently being evaluated, and hopefully in the near future we will have multiple treatment options for these children. An important point of today's session was to identify the burden of uh, caring for a child with SMA among the parents and caregivers. And hopefully, with these new emerging treatments, uh, we will decrease the burden of disease both on the children and their caregivers. 
and see an improved quality of life and see, ideally that these children will grow up to be independent and functioning on their own. So it's a wonderful time to be involved uh, with SMA and I hope we've been able to share some of that enthusiasm with you today. This activity has been jointly provided by Penn State College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash FSB. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Biogen.